Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be looking at the line of best fit again. Previously, we did this for linear least squares, but this time we're going to be looking at nonlinear least squares. So the nice thing about this is that it opens up the type of equations that we're allowed to use. But of course, our solution methodology is going to be quite a bit more intensive. So before and now, we're trying to fit some y values, which are based on x values and data. So we have x paired with y. And we want to match that with a series of functions. But we can actually generalize it in this case to look at just a single function which is a function of x and also is based on some number of parameters. And we can just continue on until c of n. So as an example, we can use a function that looks something like c1 times cosine of c2t plus c3. So just the completely generalized cosine curve, we can go ahead and write that in as our function. The important thing to note here is that we cannot simply write this as a sum of parameters multiplied by some function. There's no way to reorient this equation in that context. So what we're going to do is go ahead and write out our data in terms of these equations. So we can say that y1 is equal to c1 cosine of c2 t1 plus c3. And we can do that for a couple of other points as well. Now, just like before, this function that we came up with is never going to perfectly match all of our data, unless we just happen to have exactly three points in this case, right? If our parameters match the number of points perfectly, then we can get a perfect solution. But in general, we have a lot more points than that. So for each of these points, we're going to have something called a residual. And I'm going to define this residual as the actual data point minus the function that we come up with. So for each of these points, if we have some set of parameters that we're using, then we will have some error associated with that problem. Now, this being said, we have not come up with a solution methodology yet. We said that we can't just use this to create an A matrix and multiply that by our C matrix because we can't rewrite this as a matrix vector multiplication. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to take some initial guesses of our values and calculate our residuals, and then we're going to use Taylor series in order to figure out how much to change these parameters. So let's go ahead and write out what this actually looks like. If we are changing our parameters, we'll still have our f of x. Let's specifically leave this with f of x1. And our c values are going to be modified from their original state. So I'm going to call these c1 prime, c2 prime, and c3 prime. Taylor series is going to tell us how exactly this changes things. Well, we know that we're still going to have our original value. So this is going to be f of x1 with parameters c1, c2, and c3, the original parameters that we have. But now we need to know some information on how our function f changes with c1. Because what we're going to do is multiply this by how that specific function is changing. So this is going to be multiplied by c1 prime minus c1. And we'll do the same thing with c2 and c3. So this is our Taylor series. Now, the important thing is that we need to evaluate these functions based on our x equal to x1, our c1s. Now, the important thing here is that we need to evaluate these derivatives at the point x equals x1. And we're also going to be using our original guess. We're going to be using c1, c2, c3 to determine these derivatives. 
Now let's talk about what we're actually aiming for here. Our goal is that once we modify these parameters, we're going to end up with exactly our y term. So we want all of this together to be equal to y1. Now we know that this f here is equal to y1 minus r1. So we can replace this value here with exactly that. Our f is equal to y1 minus r1, our current error. So once we have that, our y1s will actually cancel out, and we'll be left with the r1 over on the right-hand side. So let's go ahead and rewrite this a little bit simpler. So I'm going to say that our df with respect to c1 multiplied by a delta c1. So I'm just writing this, defining this as delta c1 plus the other derivatives multiplied by their deltas. All that together is going to be equal to just r1 because these y1s are going to cancel out and the r1 is going to move to the right-hand side. Now remember that these derivatives were calculated based on x equals x1. And this r1 is actually based on how far off our original guess was for x1. So that's how this is localized to specifically the data point x1. So if we wanted to redo it for x2, well, the left-hand side would look pretty much the same, and the right-hand side would just be r2. But the important thing to notice is that our derivatives are going to be evaluated at x equals x2. So that's how the left-hand side is changing as we change our row here. So all that being said, we can go and write this out for however many points we have. And our final value should end up something along the line of uh, df by dc1 delta c1. And that's all going to be equal to our m. And of course, the important thing is that all of this is at x equals xm. We're evaluating all those derivatives at this point instead. Okay, so now that we have all this, what do we actually do? Well, at this point, we can actually write a linear system of equations. It's just that our linear system of equations are based on these deltas rather than the C1 directly. Our solution is going to tell us how to change our parameters, not exactly what those parameters are. So writing this out as a matrix vector equation, we're going to end up with our DFDCs. And these can be confusing. You just have to remember that each row is evaluated at a different x value. <clears throat> That's going to be multiplied by our delta c's. And finally, our right-hand side is just going to be our residual values. And once again, we're going to call this the A matrix. This we could call C, but I'm actually just going to call it a delta C matrix. And then our right-hand side is our residual matrix. So we have A delta C is equal to R. And once again, we can't just invert this A matrix because it's not square. Uh, we have to make it square in order to invert it. So we're going to go ahead and calculate this, our normal A transpose A, which is going to be multiplied by delta C, and that's going to be equal to A transpose R. And using that equation, we get a delta C. So this delta C gives us a hint as to how to change our parameters. And of course, this is an iterative process. And it's subject to all the same scary things of divergence uh, that you have to worry about with the Newton method whenever you're doing things with nonlinear equations there. These are still nonlinear equations. They can still break. And so you still need to be careful with finding good initial guesses. That being said, 
a lot of times we can get some good initial guesses, especially with cosine terms. We can kind of guess what the frequency is approximately, and then hopefully our C3 and C1 will be able to change based on that. So the difficulty is calculating these DFDCs and then creating this A matrix, and then finally performing this calculation. Once we have our new C parameters, then we go ahead and recalculate all of our approximate Y values, see what the residuals are for each of these using this equation, and then recalculate our Jacobian matrix, our A, which has all these derivatives in it. And then once we do that, we can just continue iterating until we finally converge on an answer there. And so you want to run a certain number of iterations, or you want to see how far this goes until it stops changing by a certain amount. But we just keep on updating our C values until we converge to a solution. So good luck coding this up. I hope you have some fun with it.